This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today we welcome carnivore ecologist and assistant professor at Mississippi State University, Dr. Dana Morin. She's here to talk about the coyote of Mississippi. Sometimes seen as an invasive species, we'll talk about the role of the coyote in Mississippi wildlife and how you should interact with these animals, especially when they're in residential areas. Dr. Major's here, ready for your pet questions, and Libby always likes to hear and discuss your recent brushes with nature. Join our conversation this morning. Give us a call. The number's 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at, <clears throat> at mpbonline.org. And if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So, good morning, Libby. Uh, let's start with you. Good to have you back with us. Oh, I'm glad to be back. So, um, as most listeners probably know, you were out west in Oregon visiting uh, relatives and, and, and vacationing and, and having a great time kind of crisscrossing the U.S. But uh, sort of from a natural perspective, what do you think the major differences are between where we are and where you went to visit? Oh, gosh, there's so many differences. And uh, f- on a personal level, I guess what I notice is almost an atmospheric change. There's a feeling about Mississippi that, you know, I came home to that hug of humidity and temperature, and and maybe has a little bit to do with um, the lack of a breeze. You know, there's there's pretty much a constant breeze in Corvallis, I guess partly because we're between the coast and the mountains, and there's all kinds of temperature variants, and so even when there's humidity, it feels a little different. So it's that Mississippi hug that I get when I come back that um, I don't know I find it comforting I, I think any of us who've uh, fl- flown anywhere or traveled anywhere you're right I, m- I remember every time when I go somewhere when I get off the plane that that smacks you in the face when you get <laughs> off it's like yeah I'm back home that's for sure so as we said glad to have you back uh, and, and appreciate you, you you even helped out a couple of times uh, on your travel so we pr- certainly appreciate what you do for the show Uh, Good morning, Dr. Major. We're going to be talking about coyotes this morning. Their teeth are probably one of their most distinctive features, which reminds us, maybe remind us how important it is to take care of teeth in our pets. Absolutely. Incidentally, it's always good to get back home, regardless of the humidity and anything. (laughs) I I, I, I do miss when I'm gone away, when I've gone away, uh, just coming back. And as uh, Libby said, it may be kind of a hug, but it's, it's good. And, uh, we do have some seasonal changes going on right now, and uh, we're seeing some seasonal allergies uh, cropping up, you know, just uh, probably like you're seeing in people. Teeth are very important, obviously. Uh, teeth, uh, the dental uh, situation, both the dog and the cat, uh, can cause some severe problems, uh, can contribute to heart disease, kidney disease and other things, but uh, it's good for you to inspect your uh, dog or cat's mouth periodically, and if you see anything that's troubling or if you detect a really bad odor, you need to contact your veterinarian and have them check it out. Uh, And is that something you would do sort of when folks bring in their pet for the annual checkup, uh, that I guess teeth would be one of the things that you check? We always try to do that, and uh, sometimes... uh, Sometimes the patient does not like that idea of looking at the teeth. <laughs> but in, in general, we do try to look at the teeth uh, each time we're doing a physical exam. And that is important. Uh, I used to think that, you know, different types of food could cause different uh, situations with the teeth. But I see dental tartar build up a plaque and gum disease with both dry food and wet food. So it can occur. And a lot of it has to do with genetics, I'm convinced. There are some animals that uh, their teeth stay pretty pristine, even going on into old age. Uh, and we've talked about this before on the air, and I remember a suggestion, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, I think in the past, have suggested that maybe early on at, with puppies and kittens, get, the, get them used to the idea of, of being near their mouth. And you, I think you would suggest once maybe some gauze on the tip of your finger and just gently uh, massaging the gums. Is that right? 
Right, and you can start out by just massaging from the outside. Uh, a lot of the little dogs and cats don't mind you doing that. In other words, massaging the lips uh, and then it, uh, graduate to uh, either using a gauze or even a small soft toothbrush. Uh, some dogs will let you do that. Uh, very few cats that I know will let you do that. But uh, certainly you can help uh, prevent some of the tartar buildup. And that's what starts, and you get tartar buildup, and then you get uh, plaque, which is a hardened uh, form of the tartar, and it does cause gum disease or and can really cause some problems. We see a lot of animals come in that the roots of the teeth are exposed because of that. Uh, just a personal update. I think I mentioned on the air last week and talked with you briefly, Dr. Major, about uh, my cat's uh, clip, uh, trying to clip my cat's nails. Uh, and, you know, so I thought, well, all right, I'll take the slow approach. So the last couple, week or so I've been, when he's laying down, sort of just grabbing his paw and sort of, you know, gently massaging it or whatever. And the other day he didn't seem to mind too much, so I thought, okay, well, here's my chance. So I ran into the bathroom, got the nail clipper, and got it out. And I swear, before I even got two <laughs> feet from him, he got up and ran out of the room. So I remember last week, too, we were talking about how pets seem to have intuition when things like that are coming. So I'm I'm going to keep on, but... Uh, but uh, surprise, surprise, he outsmarted me again. Absolutely, and they, they understand, and uh, a lot of times they're a whole lot smarter than we think. But they can read our emotions, our intentions, and uh, a lot of times, as you said, the cat knew that you were going after the Clippers. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that fight's not over yet. Well, like I said, I'm going to ease into it, and I'll, I'll get, I think I will get it done eventually. So, um Good. I think I read or saw uh, on the news that it is going to be a little chilly this week, uh, this weekend, that is. I think maybe down into the, maybe near 50? Anyway, uh, again, when we talk about weather changes, what are some things to keep in mind to keep our pets happy as well? You know, this is a time of the year probably that they, most of them are very happy with the cooler weather, uh, outdoor dogs especially. Uh, we're not anticipating i don't think anything uh in the 30s anytime soon but uh, always provide shelter uh we're gonna have some rain i believe uh tomorrow uh and it may be cooling off quite a bit uh, i saw one weather report that said in the 40s at night so uh we may have some much cooler weather but you know everybody understands that i think and dogs do need shelter and uh, maybe uh, when it gets really cold Maybe even a little extra food uh, for energy uh, during the cold weather. Now, Dr. Major, before we um, get off of the teeth, I had a question because, you know, those dentist sticks and those other kind of chews, how effective are they? Do they really help with the maintaining of the uh, pet teeth, especially dogs? You know, there are some that have uh, enzymatic uh, properties that supposedly help prevent tartar and some of those may work uh, i know a lot of the chews are really eaten up pretty quickly and not chewed on i guess would be the best thing to say uh, i have had some issues where dogs would swallow a fairly large number of uh, chews and then be unable to pass them so be careful with that i wouldn't uh, would certainly see how your dog does with that there's some of the hard chews that are virtually indestructible that some dogs will chew on, and it does help um, from that standpoint. Uh, there are a few that you can put peanut butter or something in, and the dog can work to try to get that out, and uh, those may help as well. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering about that because my dog, the dentist sticks are really like treat sticks because they're kind of right. soft, and he just eats them up. And I was like, "This is not, you're not cleaning your teeth. You're eating right. a treat. <laughs> These are gone pretty quickly. That's uh, exactly right. And uh, just keep looking and chew something. Uh, the rawhide chews, some of those the dogs can get in trouble with if they swallow a large portion. Um, most of them are digestible to a certain extent, but they can cause a blockage if they have a large amount of the rawhide. So be careful that uh, and some dogs handle things that other dogs can't uh, and some people feed bones to their dogs well there can be an issue with that and they can certainly have a particle that can be sharp penetrate the intestine and can cause some problems 
So be very careful with what you're feeding your dog as far as that type of thing. You know, I think, as always, I would say that uh, Dr. Major's on the air with us giving some general suggestions. You know, the specific uh, situation for your pet, uh, that's between you and your vet because that's who, the one who knows the best. And Dr. Major, like I said, just gives out some general information and tries to answer your pet questions as best he can. But always, I think, a follow-up uh, with your vet to make sure that your pet's getting the best care possible. It is time for the first break of the hour. When we get back, we will invite our guest, Dr. Dana Morin, to the conversation. She's a carnivore ecologist and assistant professor at Mississippi State University. Coyotes is our subject today, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to join the show. Call with questions and comments. Our phone number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Stay tuned. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest today is Dr. Dana Morin. If you want to join our conversation with a question or comment, the number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email the show, send it to animals at mpbonline.org. So good morning, Dr. Morin. Thanks for joining us. If you could start out, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to work with coyotes. Oh, um, by accident. Uh, so um, I, uh, I'm from New England originally, and uh, I ended up in California working for a restoration company, so a soil ecology and restoration company. And uh, while I was out there, I, end, um, I uh, was working in the desert, and I just became fascinated with them. And so I got involved with some work and ended up doing my master's in San Diego on um, coyotes and urban interactions with um, – or, or, or interactions with urban coyotes and – um, and yeah, I just I find them fascinating. They're they're troublemakers, but you got to respect how persistent they are and how successful they are at um, just thriving in almost any any habitat type. So. So can we say coyote and coyote interchangeably? Yeah, and I, I, I switch up, and I, I don't even notice it. Um, I think it's regional. Um, so, you know, I grew up in the East Coast, so I, I said coyote growing up, and then when I moved out West, uh, I was working with people that said coyote more, and it just kind of adopted, and now I can't seem to make up my mind. Yeah, to me, coyote seems very Western. I guess you think of the old Westerns on movies and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and then is is what is, is one of them called versus is it a coyote and several coyote? I mean, is it same singular oh, or plural? Interesting. No, I haven't thought of that. I think I say plural either way. Yeah, I think it's pretty flexible. But I might. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a linguist, so that might not be. <laughs> and uh, what is a group of coyotes called? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> oh uh, I mean, we, they they're in fam- they, they 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 exist in family groups. Sometimes people call them packs, but they're also. Um, there are some ecologists that take issue with that and say that their group size isn't truly structured like a pack, um, with, where you have more of the hierarchy. It's, it's usually what you, what you usually have is a, a breeding pair and then the pups from that year. And in some circumstances, some of those will stay an additional year um, if, if it's really difficult to disperse or if dispersal or leaving their natal or their, their home, home territory is really dangerous. And often they'll, they'll do what we call delayed dispersal. So they'll stick around. And so then sometimes you'll start to see a few more, but it's, it's really a family group. Yeah. Uh, what about their range? Where do we see coyote in the entire U.S.? Everywhere, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They've been they've been really successful. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're. I mean, they're a medium sized canid. They're they're, om- they're they're omnivorous, which means they'll eat a whole bunch of different types of food. So they can be very adaptable. Um, and so, um, yeah. So so you know, when you think about when you know colonists first arrived in the U.S. from from Europe, uh, they were primarily in the plains in the West. But with changes in habitats from, you know, um, clearing forests in the east and then um, and predator uh, hunting campaigns um, early on in the um, in, in, in our nation's history, um, the a lot of the larger predators were extirpated or were mo- removed from the landscape. And the coyotes have been able to take advantage of that and move across um, and, and do that. So now they're they're pretty much everywhere in North America. And there's even a study on some down in Panama. Hmm. So. Um, are they an invasive species? So not technically. So, um, and I wouldn't say so, but they're uh, so invasive in from the uh, from the ecological standpoint. Invasive means that they um, have some sort of detrimental effect on other populations, on native populations there. So, do they expand and go to new areas? Yes, they do. Um, uh, that can mean that they're non-native sometimes, but uh, um, but they they've really kind of become part of the system and where, where they've gone. And most of those systems were um, had canid. Um, 
species within their kind of their their food web, and so it's not entirely novel um, to, for them to for for the other species to be interacting with the canid again. Um, but they uh, but. That they're not. We're not finding really any evidence that they're doing substantial damage to other populations. So I wouldn't call them invasive. Today on Creature Comforts, we're visiting with our guest, Dr. Dana Morin. Uh, we're going to be talking about coyotes throughout the hour. Dr. Major's here, ready for some pet questions, and we always like to hear your uh, brushes with wildlife, your wildlife uh, experiences. Uh, so give us a call if you'd like to join the show at one eight seven seven MPB Ring. Our phone number is one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Um, so what brings coyotes to an area? Do they kind of take advantage of a situation they find, like you said, maybe that some other sort of predators have been removed from an ecosystem or something? Yeah, yeah. so um, so canids in general are very territorial, So uh, and they, they defend their territories. They, they're, they're very aggressive with each other. So whether it's another species or another family group of coyotes, they're constantly kind of... Um, uh, exploring the boundaries of their territories and looking for opportunities to move out. And so um, so that's been one of the interesting things we've been seeing is that um, harvest of coyotes doesn't work very well for actually lowering their population levels because there's other coyotes just waiting on the edges, waiting to move in as soon as you remove one of the ones from the territory. So, But they're, I mean, they're, they're motivated by food, so like most of us. So. <laughs> Um, so describe a coyote for us in terms of size, what sort of colors they come in and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so they're smaller than people think, I think. So they're, they're typically somewhere in the 30-pound, 40-pound range, especially in the, in the southeast. Uh, they get a little larger farther up north. Um, there's been some um, hybridization with, uh, with wolves when you get into Canada and, that, and, and a little bit in Maine. Um, but overall, they're, they're, they're kind of a medium-sized dog. Uh, they tend to be western coyotes are tawny, um, and, and you'll get a, a little bit of variation in color as they get older. Um, they get lighter. Uh, but um, eastern coyotes have a really interesting history in that when they were expanding their range, um, when you're a male coyote and you're, you're leaving your home range and you go out to an area where there's no female coyotes, we think there was a little bit of introgression with dogs, meaning we think that a couple of those early settler coyotes with, that were moving out east and in particular into North Carolina, that they had some interactions with dogs. So we get some really neat coat colors in eastern coyotes. Um, so uh, so I've, I've, I've captured, I've, d I've done a lot of capture and handling to put collars on the coyotes and study them. And I've captured coyotes that were like strawberry blonde. Mm -hmm. uh, we get about 10% of the population that's melanistic or a black coyote. Um, they can get these really beautiful markings like mantles, like a wolverine or, um, or chest, like the white chest blaze like you see on dogs. Um, and so, uh, so yes, yeah, so you get some interesting, you get, we get some more variation in the coat, the coat and pelage um, for the east. And that's, they can be really beautiful, quite honestly. Now, Dana, you said that they are about the size of a medium dog. Mm -hmm. Will they be mistaken for a dog? I mean, if you're in just, say, like a residential area and a coyote has come down, is it, it, could they be mistaken for a dog? I, th I think they could if you're not, you know, I mean, especially if you see them just quickly. Absolutely. They, I mean, they look like a, a small German shepherd. What's interesting is a lot of times when I go out and start working in places and people tell me they've seen one, they'll say it was the size of a German shepherd. And I think that it's your mind plays a trick on you, that you see something that looks like a German shepherd and you associate the size with it because we're not as good at evaluating size or assessing size. So, but yeah, I think, I think both ways, right? I think that dogs can also be mistaken for coyotes. Uh, so, but yes, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Major, do you have many uh, instances of dog coyote interactions that you've seen in, in your clinic? Not really. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> I think, in some areas, and of course, uh, we may need to talk about uh, predation in small animals, and small pets like cats or small dogs, and certainly that can't happen, as I understand. So we may need to address that in this conversation. But no, uh, I've never had to treat a cow, so I would say that we see them rarely. And in my opinion, cows are excellent at camouflage. We are so, have so much greenery here that you may have cows close by to you and not know it simply because they're good at uh, we'll see them out. Um, so, uh, Dr. Morin, are co coyotes dangerous? Uh, they're a wild animal, so yeah. and they're a predator. So, of course, yeah, they're not puppy dogs. Um, but they are... Uh, 
it's it, they're adaptable in both behavior. So uh, so coyotes really become dangerous when they become habituated to humans or when they, when they become used to humans and less fearful. So uh, where we would run into the largest issues is when uh, when people are feeding coyotes, whether it's in, on purpose or inadvertently. So if you leave your dog's food out, you might be feeding a coyote. Um, but you know we we were tracing um, attacks. So so coyotes will will definitely attack small pets, and they will um, if if I mean not. Th- if if they're if they're bold enough, if they're allowed to become bold enough, um, and they will uh, and they'll attack they'll attack uh, humans at times too if they're if they're allowed to become bold enough. So the trick is to um, to keep them fearful. Um, so uh, to and to not allow them to become used to humans or, or in, in particular associate humans with food resources. So um, in terms of the health of the population here in Mississippi, is anyone in the state, all parts of the state, liable to come across one of these in in a somewhat urban or suburban setting? Yeah, I think you could probably find one. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you're likely to see one anywhere if you're to, uh, the, uh, yes, sorry, uh, anywhere, more, not more so anywhere than any other place. So, but um, I mean, they can adapt to urban habitats. They, uh, they can adapt to, to uh, the pine stands. They can adapt to, they like open habitats typically the most, but, um, but yeah, they certainly will adapt to, to any habitat. So what should someone do if they encounter a coyote? Oh, uh, don't don't um, don't interact with it in a way that's going to, you know, don't squat down. Don't try to get it to approach you. Don't try to feed it. But be bold at, back at it. Um, so we used to, um, you know, we used to go out. There was an incident in San Diego where um, where coyotes were coming into a, a senior citizen homes and they were they were attacking cats. And so we would go out with pots and pans and bang at them <laughs> and then they would run away. Um, but you're, you want to try to if, if you feel like a coyote is being um, is is testing that um that line to see if they can be bold again you want to be bold back but not not to a point where you put yourself in danger so um so if you see coyote pups should you assume that the mother or father is nearby yes yeah 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 they're they they're there's strong parental care that goes on there so yeah absolutely and then i would imagine the follow-up on that is if you see some be very wary because again the 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 parents are protecting their young, so they would be more liable to be maybe aggressive. You know, I don't know if we, if, if uh, I know we think about that maybe with bears and things like that. I don't know if we've really dis- discovered that or not with coyotes, but I certainly would not approach uh, a set of, of pups without, I mean, like, yeah. Um, no, I, I think that would be, I wouldn't test it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Better safe than sorry. Yes, on that absolutely. One. Uh, we've got a caller on the line. I think it's Bill. Good morning, Bill. You're on the air with us. Good morning. Uh, just going to tell you a couple of stories about coyotes that I had. One, I heard you talking about the color. Uh, I was driving through a cemetery in my hometown in Alabama, and what I thought was a gigantic red fox came running across the way. And, it I mean, it was marked exactly like a red fox, but uh, the long legs gave it away. And it had me confused for quite some time, but it was. It was a coyote with red fur. Second thing was uh, when I was living down in Destin, Florida, came out of my house one day and there was a coyote sitting in the front yard of the house next door. And I tried to run him away. He did not, he didn't react at all. I didn't get close to him. I just made, you know, waved my arms shouted didn't bother him he just sat there so I, i'm assuming he had become one of those that was habituated to humans all right bill thanks for the call good uh, good thoughts there um um and that uh, brings up a good uh, follow-up question um what about controlling coyote populations what is the most effective way that that we're able to do that um, well, we're not, so that <laughs> would be the main thing. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think it's hard to um, at times to wrap your head around it, but um, most predators are not. Um, so the, the thing we need immediately go to is through um, harvest. So for, at the population level, uh, coyotes don't respond to harvest because they're territorial and they, um, and they will just roll over into new territory. So they're very good. Um, at uh, at take at at, at comp- uh, uh, compensating for removals, but um, so but you can control behavior. 
So, and that's, and, and one of the things we kind of think about is that the coyote you know is better than the coyote you don't know. So if you have, if you're not experiencing problems with coyotes, they're probably in the area and you, and you have some that are well-trained essentially to avoid humans. Um, and if you go and start removing them, then you might all of a sudden have a problem, you know? So, uh, so I think it's really through behavior that we try to control the population. And the reason that harvest doesn't work well is that they're not, they're predators, they're not prey species. So their populations were never regulated by predation. They were regulated by competition with each other. So when you actually remove a bunch of coyotes, you're actually removing the mechanism that keeps their population in control. This is Creature Comforts, and it's time for another break. When we get back, we'll continue our discussion about coyotes in Mississippi with our guest, Dr. Dana Morin from Mississippi State University. You can call with questions and comments. Got some open phone lines. It's one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. And our guest today is Dana Morin, a carnivore ecologist and professor at Mississippi State University. If you missed any of today's show, you can always subscribe to the podcast to listen to back episodes and make sure you don't miss a future episode. Just uh, search for Creature Comforts on your preferred podcasting app. Always like to remind you uh, as well of the MPB public media app. When you download that for your smartphone, you get to listen to all of the MPB Think, uh, Think Radio programs on your schedule, and you can access MPB television as well. Got some open phone lines, so if you want to join our conversation this morning, you can give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. So, um, Dr. Morin, how do uh, coyotes interact with uh, some of the other creatures in Mississippi, maybe specifically uh, deer? So, yeah, so they, they are predators. They're predators of deer. They're not very effective predators of adult deer, but they'll definitely, as any predator on the landscape, will take advantage of a fawn if they come across it. Um, I think that they... Uh, and, and we're doing some research on this up in Virginia right now, but um, they, I think that a lot of it is also scavenging. So, uh, so there's a lot of shared scavenging among bobcats and coyotes and, and bears, and they compete with, with each other for it and will chase each other off carcasses and things like that. Um, but, uh, but primarily I think that they're, um, if it's predation, it's going to be on, on young deer or, or injured deer. Um, I'll, we'll also see that, especially during hunting season. Um, but, uh, or it's going to be on fawns. So. Um, so do they hunt in groups? I watched a pair of coyotes once in, in California that were trying to take down a pregnant mule deer, and it was pretty impressive. So there was, it was two adults. I'm assuming it was a breeding pair. And, uh, and one, I just saw one, and he was dancing in front of this mule deer, this pregnant mule deer, and backing her up and backing her up to this canyon. And eventually, and mule deer are heavy, right? So they'll, that's a dangerous prey for them. They're, they're a lot bigger. And eventually the mule deer kind of stomped them off and, 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 or the, the coyote away. And then I watched for a little bit longer. I was on the other side of the canyon with a set of binoculars. And then the second coyote came out from behind where she was trying to put, where, where the, the first one was trying to push it up. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they, they're definitely, um, they can be, but they're not, they're not going to be, they're not, they don't have the jaw structure really to take down an adult deer well. They have to really ha- kind of hamstring it. Um, and, and so it's something like a, a feel it is going to be much more effective at taking down deer because they have the claws and they can go for the throat. Um, whereas uh, it's, it's kind of more luck or you have to have an injured animal for them to be able to. But something down. like a rabbit or ro- what? They're what, fantastic the vole price? eaters. <laughs> they are <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, they're, All right, yeah, that's they great. Are, they, yeah, the, the 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 outside of like what? So you have to. You know, diet studies will show that they have a lot of deer in their diet. But you have to remember that scavenging one deer will show up in a whole lot of scat samples. And so, but when you find one vole skull, that's one vole that they've eaten. So, um, so we see a lot of voles, uh, mice, uh, like deer mice, uh, 
um, rats, uh, squirrels, rabbits, um, and then they'll eat a lot of vegetation, um, a lot of uh, like berries and, and, and soft mass. Um, they'll eat insects. Uh, they probably had a good year with the cicadas. They really seem to like. They seem to. We see an increase in cicadas in there when there's a big, a big boom. So, one of our memorable sightings I just thought of when you said that is, we observed coyotes knock down corn in our field. I mean, they would like jump at it yeah. and knock the corn down and then eat the ear when it was ripe. So it was like, okay, yeah. they've been watching our corn. <laughs> And they, they had done that to several stalks. I believe but, that. So yeah. they were actively working to get corn. Of course, that's pretty good sweet corn. They're re- they're, they really <laughs> yeah. are clever, clever. So there was a grad student at San Diego State who went around um, and collected um, scat samples, so fecal samples from, from coyotes. And then he, put a, he, he took them to a greenhouse, and he was germinating, like, full gardens out of them, like <laughs> watermelons, tomatoes, <laughs> cucumbers. Like, they, were, they, they really will eat anything. I mean, and I think, I, I, you know, it's kind of it's, it's putting a little bit too much of a human perspective on it, but I think they're fairly lazy dogs when it comes down to, like, if they can get an easy meal, like if they can get a cheeseburger out of the garbage can, <laughs> they're more likely to do that than have to chase down a deer. So <laughs> I need to get them to eat my voles and rats and yes. not my corn. Yeah, that, well, that's why yeah. they like those open habitats is it's better mousing habitat for them. And watching them mouse is amazing. I, I, if, if, you, if, you're, if you can track down some videos, I've gotten to watch it a little bit in the field, but um, they jump straight up into the air, and then they arch over in this perfect, like, sharp U, and then their, their snout just goes straight to the burrow or straight on the animal. It's just really precision. It's, it's, it's pretty impressive to watch. We've got some callers on the line, so let's uh, say good morning to, is it Mina in Starkville? Am I saying that right? And Nina. Okay. Good morning. Go ahead. Uh, I live in Starkville, and I just want to say that if you've never seen a coyote, but you want to know what one looks like if you do see it, I saw one in, just in a yard across the street, and the first thing I thought of was Wiley Coyote. The illustrator was just spot on. <laughs> because I knew it was a coyote because I'd watched enough cartoons. So <laughs> that, that's my only comment. All right. Mina, thanks for the call, and hey, great. We finally get a reward for watching those uh, cartoons all the time. And would you agree with that, that it's a fairly cartoonish representation? Yeah, I do. I think, And I'm laughing because that was the first coyote I ever saw, too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, it is. I think because um, it's got the exaggerated ears. I think the two things that I'm really looking for when, um, when I see a canid and I'm, my, my, the image recognition that snaps for me is the ears will seem – Large, they're, they're sharp and pointy, and they'll seem larger to the head relative to what we see for most dogs. And the other is the way they carry their tail. So they're, they'll car- they carry their tail really down, and it won't be wagging. It'll look like like when my dog runs and she's tired, the dog st- it starts to droop, and it, it looks like that. Um, so, but they almost always have their tail kind of tucked down close to their legs, as opposed to straight out or up. Uh, do we know why they do that? Uh, I don't. Uh, so I, I, I have a hypothesis about it, but um, I think that in, in, in most situations be- before um, kind of larger predators were removed, coyotes are, pr- are pretty well harassed by wolves. And I think that um, when they tuck their tail, it's harder to get a hold of them. So that's just my best guess is that it's a behavioral response to, to, to making themselves less uh, attackable. So, but I, I could be totally wrong on that. So but <laughs> we haven't studied that very well, I don't think. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today with our guest, Dr. Dana Morin from Mississippi State University, talking about coyotes or coyotes, however you would prefer, uh, depending on, I guess, which part of the country you're from. Uh, John's on the line in Jackson. Good morning, John. Go ahead. Hello there. Uh, One of the kinder terms for coyotes I've heard is the song dog. Could you tell me something about their vocalizations, how to recognize the bear, if you want to call them songs? on the kind of information they convey uh, with their vocalizations. Yeah, that's one of my favorite nick- nicknames for them, for sure. So uh, coyotes are, yeah, they're, they're very impressive. Um, and I think a lot of people think of just the howl. Um, but but often it's really more these sharp, high-pitched yips. Um, and they've been able to identify, there was one study that um, that identified, I think, 11 distinct vocalizations that they were using to communicate. And they, you can certainly hear them communicate at night. Uh, the ones that I think of the most is you hear them alerting each other when they found uh, a food, food. So they'll, you'll hear those calls. And then territorial, uh, kind of more kind of aggressive yips that you'll hear too. Uh, I did have an experience where I, um, I was collaring a coyote that I had I'd, I'd trapped for a study 
And when I released him, um, he refused to leave. He was a very dominant animal. Um, and so I have about eight minutes of video of him doing all of these different vocalizations of growls. Of I, mean, I was trying to stay back at a distance at that point. Um, so, yeah, the growls, the howls, I could hear him trying to call other individuals and kind of looking behind him and, and keeping one eye on me. And so, uh, so I've, I, I, I've gotten to see all the vocalizations and it's really, it's fascinating. Uh, eventually, he, he refused, we were having a standoff and he refused to leave and I needed to get all my equipment so I could go check the rest of my traps. And so I ended up backing away until I got around, to, around a bend in the road and I gave him about a minute. And when I went back, I came back to pick up all my equipment and he had just peed all over it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so he won that one, but I got I got the data on him on the collar. So, uh, thanks, John. Good question there. We've got some open phone lines. If you'd like to join our conversation at one eight seven seven MPB ring, it's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can always send us an email as well. Address it to animals at mpbonline.org. Uh, we're going to take a final break of the hour. We're talking throughout this hour with our guest, Dr. Dana Morin from Mississippi State University about coyotes in Mississippi. Libby's here, ready to talk about your latest wildlife encounters. Dr. Major's still on the line, ready for pet questions. Again, the phone number if you want to join in, 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. Back with more after this. The Sound of Coyotes brings us back in on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major. My goodness, that's loud. <laughs> they are having a good old time there, I hope. Uh, Libby Hartfield. And our guest today is Dr. Dana Morin from Mississippi State University. She's our resident coyote expert this morning. Uh, still time for you to join the conversation with a question or comment. Just give us a phone call, 1-877-MPB-RING. It's one 877 672 7464. You can always send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. So, Dana, that, uh, that probably sounded very familiar to you. Do you have any idea what sort of call or what they were trying to say to each other there? Or uh, I'm not an expert in their calls, but I usually associate that kind of like uh, calling as, as that they're excited about something. And so probably I usually go to food, but I'm a, I always go to food. So Someone found a cheeseburger in the garbage yes, can. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, they got voles. Voles. Lots of voles. Oh, we had a, someone leave a question, and it's asking about coyotes breeding with dogs. Is that commonplace? It's not common. But uh, so, yeah, so uh, there's this process called positive assortment, which means that animals will select individuals that look more like them. Uh, and so coyotes will tend to breed with coyotes, and they'll choose not to breed with dogs typically. But the exception tends to be uh, when there's not another coyote around. Like you'd rather pass your genes on to the next generation, even if it's with a substandard mate. So, so we don't. We see it. What, we're, what we think is we see it at the at the edge of their ranges when they're starting to expand their population. But uh, but once the population is established, I think it's very rare. Um, and earlier you mentioned a little bit about uh, some of the work that you do. If you could tell us about some of the studies you've been doing with the coyotes. So my, my Ph.D. work was, in, uh, was on coyotes in uh, the central Appalachians in Virginia. I was at Virginia Tech. Um, and, so, uh, and then I did my master's on coyotes in uh, San Diego. So I've gotten to work with urban coyotes and then forest coyotes. Um, and so, uh, so that was pretty neat. Uh, what we were looking at for um, for the in, in Virginia was really uh, looking at potential impacts to deer. Um, the populations there, they, they were worried because they'd found that um, uh, coyotes had, had become established in the area, and uh, at the same time, the forest had matured thirty years and was less productive habitat. So the deer population was lower than they remembered. But they wanted to know if there was some interaction with coyotes that was causing a problem. They also would walk around and find, hunters would walk around and find a lot of scat with deer hair in it um, and assume that it was coyote. Um, so one of the things we did was we used non-invasive genetics, which is we take DNA from the fecal samples or from samples that are left in the environment, and we can identify the individuals. And we were able to estimate the population of, of, of coyotes in the area, and we found it was actually very low density. Um, but what we also found was that the bob, there's twice as many bobcats as we thought we would we would find out there. There were more bobcats than coyotes because people were mistaking the scat for co being coyote scat because they assumed because it had deer hair in it that it was bobcats. So, uh, so that study's now developed into uh, a, a larger study where they've got bears, uh, bears, coyotes, and bobcats, and the bear population has we think has also been increasing.
seen in that part of Virginia. Um, and so we're looking at, um, I've, there, there's a graduate student who's uh, working on it right now, Robert Alonzo, who's fantastic. And uh, he's been collaring, I went out and helped on his project too. He's been collaring bears, coyotes, and bo- um, bobcats and looking at all of their interactions together um, and looking at how they share resources and, and potentially coexist or, or, or exclude each other. So I, I would imagine there's some kind of sedation when you're collaring. <laughs> well, I mean, they always don't let you come up and put a collar on, I would imagine. Well, for the bears and the bobcats, yes. But for the coyotes, we don't sedate them, no. We, uh, we find that it's easier to um, – and so I know some people will. Uh, we're not doing anything that's particularly painful. So, uh, so we, you know, we, we use uh, physical immobilization. And when you – we use like a catch pole, like what you see um, uh, animal control use. So when they're in the trap, the, the – the trickiest part is getting them in the noose around their, their, their head. But once you've got them um, secured, you can do, because it's a 35-pound dog, you can do most of the work you need to do. We put Velcro around the feet to keep the feet together so they can't run off if, they, if, we, if we pop off them. And we put Velcro around the snout so they can't bite us. Uh, and, uh, and then we can work them up without having to use the chemical immobilization drugs. And the benefit there is there's less danger of, of, of having an interaction, but also they're not groggy afterwards. So they, we can release them and they're gone. Like they can just go back to doing what they're doing. So, Got a couple of phone calls to get to, starting again on the phones with Tammy, who's called in today. Good morning, Tammy. You're on the air. Good morning. Go Hi. Ahead. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Yeah, go ahead. Me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm in Louisiana on the north shore of Lake, Lake Constant Train. And my question is about uh, what they call koi dogs. Like a year ago, I saw what I three, what I think that's what they were. They were black. It was real early morning, just white, uh, crossing the road. Three of them in a row, just crossing the road. And uh, they looked like a silhouette from a cartoon or something. And I had no idea, so I had to Google it and call the wildlife. And that's I think that's, it sounds like that's what they were. <laughs> so combination dog and coyote, I guess. And they were black. Yeah, so we'll see melanistic coyotes, and, and, and they're... And, and they're that that particular gene is spreading um is making its way west as as well as it as it was established in the east um i the only way we would really i i'd feel comfortable saying that it's definitely a, a koi dog would be to run the genetics on it and and determine the that the the parentage which we can do um but it's really difficult they can they they're they're they can be very variable in appearance. The other thing is that they're also, when they're younger, they're the, I've noticed um, in Halium, until they're about a year or two, like that second winter after they're born, their coats will be very dark, um, and they'll have some, it, it, they look more dog-like to me um, with the guard hairs and kind of like this blackish color that overlays the tawny often. So, um, so yeah, but um, it's, it's pretty rare for them to, to be breeding with, a, with, with dogs when there's other coyotes in the area. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting. That's, that's what I'm always saying. Like, grab, grab me some scat so I can look at the <laughs> genetics. So. Okay. Next time I'll, I'll try to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tammy, okay. for your call. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got our friend Sue from Beaumont is on the line. Sue, good morning. Go ahead. Yes, I was just going to mention something about koi dogs. I live in South Perry County, and all the guys down here seem familiar with they They can spot right away what a koi dog is because... I guess they spend a lot of time in the woods hunting or something. They know a koi dog when they see one, you know. But I, I was wondering if since wolves and, and, and coyotes are both canines, could they interbreed or do they ever interbreed? So, yes, they do. Um, and, again, it's the same dynamic, but this time it's the wolf making the decision. So in, in areas where wolf populations are really, really low, like there's an area up in Canada where um, the eastern wolf population has declined sharply, and they're, they're breeding with coyotes, and that's kind of what's saving their genetic lineage there. Um, so, uh, so they will, but it's, it's, it's when, they're, when there are plenty of wolves around, the wolves are actually a fairly they, – they harass the coyotes pretty, pretty well. All right, Sue, always good to hear from you. So a, a koi dog is a cross between a coyote and a dog? Yeah, that would be a first generation, yeah. yep. All right, a couple minutes left. So, again, let's uh, reiterate, if, uh, if you encounter a coyote, what, uh, what do you think, uh, what, what, do you re- what would you recommend someone to do? 
I, I, I would recommend you be bold, but not uh, reckless. So, yeah. So, um, and yeah, I think you definitely, they're not, they're not dogs. Um, I think we've run into issues in some parts of the country where people really like them and feel like an attachment or a bond to them. And that's where we start running into issues. We're the, in, in San Diego, the phrase we were always constantly saying was a, a fed coyote is a dead coyote. Um, because then you have to go in and remove them because it's it's it, once they once they lose their fear of humans you're not you're not going to re- reimpose that on them um so so to be, to be to keep the established relationship um fearful uh but also you know be wary like the the caller that called in earlier um and said that the coyote would not run away uh i'd be wary of that because it's rare but occasionally you'll see um rabies or uh or distemper in coyotes um they're less they seem to be less susceptible to it than other animals but you never that 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 struck me as an odd interaction that usually if if you run at a coyote they're going to run away not that i'm suggesting everybody run at coyotes but they will <laughs> they they usually will run away um so in an uh, encounter, what are what is the coyote doing? Just kind of looking and then imagine they're not going to come out. Well, maybe they would, but I wouldn't imagine they'd come out like the backyard and just sit in the middle of the yard, or would they? So we have had issues. I, I think it just is them constantly testing their boundaries and assessing. Um, we have had issues in the Northeast where they will, and, and, and some other areas, but the one I'm thinking of in particular was one in Massachusetts where there were two coyotes that were following um, like a woman walking her dogs. And those are ones that have been habituated. And those, unfortunately, the only solution at that point is to remove them. So, um, so we've been talking about coyotes throughout the hour. If someone is interested and wants to learn more, any uh, way you would point them, maybe online or other sorts of resources? Uh, sure, yeah. There's... Um, well, they can they, if, if they if they have sightings, they can email me. So, <laughs> if, especially the if the collar with the red the, the red fox markings, if you got pictures, that'd be great. Um, that sounds exciting. Uh, so, um, so resources you got to be. I think you got to be skeptical on some of them. There's a lot of lore that goes along with coyotes. So, um, stick to to the truly reputable resources that you trust. Uh, MDWFMP has a website um, that has great information on it. The museum has here has a great great information on it. Um, I'm not thinking of anything in particular that I, you know, we have, we have, there's a group of uh, ecologists that all work on coyotes. Uh, we don't have anything established really for um, like a network that would, that would provide information, but your, your local state agencies would be the first place I would go to. And just got about a minute left. Uh, the cooler weather kind of stirs up maybe our, our pet dogs. Would we see possibly more coyote interaction in the cooler weather absolutely yeah well as soon as at the top of the hour you're saying that you mentioned the cooler weather i was like oh this is such a great trapping time because so, <laughs> they really move around and i think most animals do it's something about the barometric pressure shifting too and they just all start to move around and your your, your capture rates go way up so yeah now before we get out of here um wolves in mississippi yeah do we have those not that I know of, so, but I'm willing to look at the genetics if anybody finds something. So, so are the coyotes like the, the the top predator? Yes, out there. Yeah, well, and they're and they're not a very good one. They're, they're, yeah, we'd call that the apex predator. Um, in 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 systems where there aren't wolves or mountain lions, what you end up with is. Um, bears and bobcats and coyotes kind of sharing that role and they have these interactions and kind of pushes back and forth but none of them is truly dominant over the other ones that'll wrap us up for today creature comforts is a production of mississippi public broadcasting think radio funding provided in part by listeners like you if you need to hear today's show or a previous show visit mpbonline.org slash creature comforts our show is produced by java chapman our call screener this morning was liz gill so for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest, Dr. Dana Morin, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned. It's AutoCorrect coming up next with a big new announcement, so stay tuned for AutoCorrect only on MPB Think Radio.